Good afternoon and welcome to Saturday Sesh. My name is Trey Reckling, the founder and director of Academy of Cannabis Science. We do these informational, conversational sort of uh, meetings twice a month, the first and third of every month, unless we have something really weird. But we've even hung with that during the pandemic, so I think we're going to stick with it. Um, what Saturday Sesh is, is an opportunity to gather with friends and cannabis family or soon-to-be cannabis family and uh, talk about the things that um, are important to you by way of industry professionals. And we ask those people to come in and talk about what they're passionate about and tell us why. And so we're so lucky today to have Jerry Whiting. And speaking of professional, Jerry has not only been a cannabis professional for many years, but has also uh, been specializing in the hemp industry, which is very, very different and distinct, although of the same family. Um, Jerry, hey, we're glad to have you do my introduction a little bit better justice, if you would. Well, you did a really good job. Uh, my name is Jerry Whiting. I live in Seattle, Washington, and I'm the co-founder and president of a company called LeBlanc c &E. um, We started out uh, just about eight years ago to the day uh, in the medical marijuana market. <clears throat> um, my Two of my two kids developed a seizure disorder at the onset of adolescence. Coleman, my middle child, approached me about transitioning from big pharma to cannabis to address his seizures. And I demurred and said, well, yeah, I used to practice acupuncture and I know the plant, but Martin A. Lee, Project CBD, uh, will be here in two and a half weeks. And that's because uh, my wife Lisa and I have hosted speakers and presenters, uh, exhibitors at uh, HempFest for like nine of the last 10 years, something like that. Marty and I go back to Ann Arbor in the 70s. So uh, Marty stayed for six days, left me a mason jar of uh, CBD positive cannabis, and my life hasn't been the same since. So um, it started out um, um, finding the plants that had CBD, and lab tests, including cannabinoid profiles, were just starting then. Long story short, I'm a collector by, by nature, and I began to collect those rare genetics uh, that included 4% or greater CBD. Um, Coleman and I both worked at Green Lion, a processing facility in uh, Seattle. Uh, he did CO2 extractions. I was more about the plants and genetics as well as making tinctures and topical oil. So we fast forward and three years ago, I began to change what the seeds and plants that I collected from cannabis to hemp. And uh, there were appreciable amounts of CBD, but also other minor cannabinoids, terpenes, and other compounds. But the best thing was, it was easier to grow compared to pot. There was no extra excise tax. You could sell across state lines, if not internationally, and you don't go to prison. So, I'm a recreational user, user par excellence, but uh, professionally, I do hemp. Um, not just CBD <clears throat> terpenes for medicine, but more recently, fiber, including hempcrete and paper, as well as other stuff. So 25 words or less, I uh, started out being like the Johnny Appleseed and sharing genetics all over the place. And now I'm more like George Washington Carver, uh, delving into um, decorticating, um, uh, vast and herd, uh, and uh, making even more exotic medicine. Well, and, Elevator pitch. Well, no, and you, you speak about George Washington Carver, who, um, as a person from Georgia, I appreciate, you know, we had lots of peanuts in Georgia, and George Washington Carver said, you can make everything out of these. Don't throw away a thing. And uh, speaking of throwing away, you know, at one point, people would throw away hemp seed hulls. And this is a jar of Jerry Whiting hemp seed hulls that are wonderful. If you have never put these on cereal or toasted them and put them in a salad, or I just eat them by the spoonful because I know they're high in protein and, and, and really nutritious, but man, these are great. Yeah, they're actually the hearts, the inside of the seeds. You can find them in one pound bags everywhere from Trader Joe's and Costco to your local grocery store. Most of them are grown in Manitoba. So no matter what color the package, it's the same product. Um, best eaten fresh and, you know, great nutritional value. 
But you're right, Trey. Um, people compare uh, cannabis, uh, high THC stuff to, to the wine industry. But when I think about hemp and its utilitarian purposes, it's more like soybeans or peanuts. That you can make construction materials, electronics, uh, portions of plastics, as well as medicine out of hemp. And uh, there aren't many plants that are so multifaceted as well as being uh, regenerative and uh, conducive to sustainable cultivation. And, it, and, and thanks for reminding me, hearts, I've said, I've said otherwise a couple of times. Um, versatility, yes, hemp can do, you know, it can be fiber, it can be building materials, it can be uh, food, livestock, feed, all these sort of things. So you have two particular areas of interest, though. Could you tell us about uh, the fiber part of it? Because I know we had a chance to talk and all I was right. fascinated with what you got going on. So I started out, of course, chasing CBD. But I knew that there was other utilitarian applications for the plant. And early on, uh, I began making a topical uh, oil for aches and pains, spasms, et cetera, using the root. Completely different chemistry, no cannabinoids, no terpenes, but those two triterpenoids that, um, and I was also interested because the Romans and the Chinese both used the root as the poultice. Never smoked, never eaten. It's, it, Bells went off because I used to practice acupuncture. And if the Chinese used it, that was good enough for me. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> this year I'm growing on two lo in two locations, hopefully a third, half medicine in one location, mostly uh, fiber in the other, but we're growing a number of different cultivars, some from the EU, some feral Chinese stuff. Oh, hemp for victory survivors from Missouri. But with the focus on... Um, paper first, textiles, and then my partner is more interested in hemp creek. So I liken it to Jack Spratt and his partner. I want the, the, the uh, <laughs> bass, the bark, if you will, on the outside. She wants the herd, the wood, the shiv on the inside. And so we look at the field and there's a fork in the road. Um, yeah, and then we have some cultivars that have fiber potential as well as uh, CBD and CBM and CBG in the flower, these minor cannabinoids, as well as, of course, the root, which I've used to make medicine. So that whole plan, that's the buffalo model, you know? Wow. Everything gets so, used. You said everything gets used, on, and you kind of, you flew through a lot of information. You said you're talking about you have possession of some hemp for victory seeds. I know what you mean, but tell us a little bit more about this. Yeah. So I, I'm a collector. I, so I had a software company for like 27 years. It was barcode software. I collect uh, art, you know, photography of the civil rights movement. It's now a lot of it's in the Smithsonian. By nature, I collect, I'm like, you know, what I call COCD, constructively OCD. So I have a great seed bank. And the motto has always been broad but shallow. While I do have pounds and pounds of uh, the same fiber cultivar, Han Ma, grown in China to be exported here, I have a bunch of just odd stuff. And what it, so, so people in the Canna family who know me, the, what I call the breeders and seeders, they respect what I do and they trust me. And so I often, uh, I'm often gifted unique genetics because people have the belief that I will do the right thing. And I'm also sort of analogous to that seed bank in the Finnish glacier. So I've got this stuff tucked away, but it's also backed up other places um, in controlled situations. And, um, and uh, so, yeah, I, you know, I could go on forever. But. Well, and well, I, had, I had this one, an EU cultivar, uh, Italian, called Campanola. And it has uh, uh, 4 or 5% CBD, CBM, CBG. I assume since it's making CBG to A to get to those cannabinoids, they're terpenes as well. And of course, the, the fiber, it's one of those 12 to 15 feet tall plants. So fiber. The herd on the inside is wood, let's say. You chip it up, add lime, you have hempcrete. I'm more interested in paper and textiles, and I used last year's CBD stems, mine and others, to separate, to decorticate, to pull the, 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 
the wood part, the stems mm -hmm. apart. And I worked with two paper makers, a large nonprofit of the country's largest art paper makers, Morgan Conservatory in my hometown of Cleveland, and a childhood friend who retired from Hollywood and is in New Mexico. And what did he do in his, his new free time? He has a small art paper studio. So I have two test kitchens. And as I'm learning how to do the chemistry, they're going back and forth, sharing each other's samples and techniques. Mm -hmm. The reason I chose paper first, the first thing a paper maker does is put it in the blender and chop it up. Because these were plants grown for CBD extraction, they were Christmas, Christmas tree style farms. They were five feet on center to encourage lateral growth and higher flower yield. For fiber, you plant like three, four pounds an acre. You want things really close together because then the plant is st continually stretching to reach the sunlight. Mm -hmm. So you want long, tall fibers with very little side growth if you're growing for fiber. And the best fiber comes from male plants before flowering. So there's one of those Jekyll and Hyde or mm -hmm. what Marty calls the trickster. So when you grow for medicine, you want females that have lots of side growth and flower. And you push that flower up against that 0 0.3 THC to get the maximum yield. I'm going to cut before flower. And I'm, I'm, I'm in the position, if I clone anything, I'm going to clone the males to have more of them as opposed to the females. Completely upside down, inside out, and backwards from the cannabinoid terpene market that we all are so used to. Um, but yeah, I'm doing field trials. There's a weather uh, data logger. The temperature and humidity is me measured every minute. It's transferred to my blue, uh, to be a Bluetooth to my phone to go into Excel so that we can measure the height, look at the growth patterns for each of the cultivars, and uh, map it against uh, microclimate stuff. And uh, so I'm growing a whole bunch of Han Ma, this Chinese cultivar that we all see on the other end. But also, um, I haven't done an audit yet. I'll bet there are 12 or 15 other fiber cultivars and probably 30, 35, 40 medicine. I mean, just goofy shit. And, and if y'all have never seen, um, you talk about growing close, that's exactly the technique recommended in uh, Hemp for Victory, which of yes. course was right during World War II when hemp went from being illegal, illegal and enemy of the state to they're like, oh, we really need a lot of the fiber. Everybody who grows it is now a patriot. And so the government supplied tons and tons of the seed, which if not for people like Jerry would be lost. Jerry, I got to tell you, um, you're one of the pe first people I met in the industry here and you're always so welcoming, never made me feel like some outsider, but you really got me interested in the whole film canister theory. And, and, and Jerry was one of the first people to tell me, said, no, I want that person who said, I've got this canister of seeds from way back when. I don't even know what they are. Um, he really piqued my interest because Jerry doesn't, isn't in the mood or, or interested in throwing stuff away when it's, until it's been, you know, explored and, and um, discovered, so to speak. So, I want to thank oh, you straight, for helping me appreciate the genetics and holding on to stuff that predates all the shortcake and, you know, oh, yeah. all those crazy hybrids we have now. Well, it's funny because this is how I met Eric Boone. He came to a Cannabis Alliance meeting, introduced himself to Laura Kaminsky and mentioned that he had something. And Laura said, oh, you got to talk to Jerry. You remember that, Eric? Totally. Totally. Yeah, yeah, I lived in uh, I lived in India from 2014 to 2016 and collected a bunch of Landry seeds. Wow. And I really wanted to get those in the hands of someone whose thumb was considerably greener than my own, uh, which mine is not. And so, yeah. Hey, thanks, Eric. That's a great example. And so, please, you guys value when people say that to you. Um, you know, make sure they appreciate the value or, or share that with somebody who can do just that. Um, I, when we taught down at Muckleshoot Tribal College um, for several weeks, a guy came up to me and said the same thing. He said, oh, I don't even know what these things are. And I said, I'll trade you. And so we did some trading and, and I, had, I smoked my Muckleshoot special, or I call it Lovejoy Kush because his name is, is, is related. There you go. Yeah. See, people, oh, I'm not going to show return interest. This is an old friend. <laughs> Uh, I'm 66 and she's, I think, four years older than me. This came in the mail recently. You know, I was cleaning the house 
I stumbled across an old film canister from back in the day. I love that. So here's the deal. Um, let me do a little intro. Um, cannabis sativa L. Um, let's set aside indica hybrid sativa. I tend to use those as adjectives to describe the experience imparted by cannabis because it really, in today's world, for most people, they're, everyone's smoking a hybrid. It might be indica-like, sativa-like in the middle, but you really aren't smoking what was smoked 100 or 2,000 years ago. Of course not. Well, speak for yourself. So, um, extinct is forever, whether it's polar bears or exotic birds or heirloom tomatoes or cannabis sativa L. So, um, let's set aside the indica hybrid sativa model and type of, talk about type 1, type 2, type 3 plants. Type 1 plants are THC dominant, what I call cannabis, others call marijuana, reefer pot, ganja, etc. Type 2 plants are mixed CBD and THC, close to one to one in the, that part of the belt curve from lab results. And type three plants are low THC, but usually have CBD and other things. So hemp being legally three. defined as 0.3% THC or less is a type three plant. It is low in THC by the legal limit, which really has little, little resemblance to botany or taxonomy, but that's the law in the U.S. these days. And um, unlike the, so I grew up in Ohio and Michigan, and we'd be driving along on the country road and see something in a farmer's field and pull over and pull it up, you know. You got a headache, you didn't get high. This was hemp for victory survivors from the government encouraging American flowers to replace what was in the Philippines under Japanese control because they needed hemp for more time use for rope. So um, now, of course, I want to drive those same country roads and save those, those seeds. Um, extinct is forever. And while we think we know what the potential of the plant is and cherry wine and other and box and auto for CBD and this, that, and the other for fiber, we, if we lose cultivars, we lose the ability to mine that genetic database for uses we haven't even discovered yet. So it's imperative that there is a, because, you know, uh, for most plants like orchids and roses and corn, there's a, you know, a museum, a conservatory, a university where they're in drawers and the interns keep the notes and, you know, but that doesn't happen because it's been illegal for so long. So there are a number of what I call breeders and seeders who are either actively collecting and breeding stuff on the rec side, but also trading film canisters. And, you know, I was lucky enough to take part in a little international exchange and have some Jamaican genetics that I haven't grown out yet, but there is this underground. And it's important that we, you know, I like modern hybrids recreation much as the next person, but there's something about so I had the pleasure, I met him at Hempfest, meeting someone. I was telling the, the film canister story. And he turned it. I, my, my family, my, my kids and their friends were helping me do the Project CBD booth. The weekend of the Charlotte Figgy Sanjay Gupta thing. So the emphasis is on CBD. And this guy sits down next to me behind the booth. At, it's Sunday, I'm tired. And he, I was saying, you know, I'm looking for uh, film canisters and old school stuff, yada, yada, yada. And he calmly says, would you like to get high like we did in high school? And I turned and looked at him. He That's said, funny. film canister, two seeds, both girls, I got one. Would you like to get high like we did in high school? And he pulls a full pipe out of his pocket. We take a couple hits, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, Oh my God, I'm in 11th grade again. <laughs> now, the, the, that's the first chapter. The follow-up. That's chapter. awesome. The second chapter was, I, ha I, I met at HempFest, Future of Strains. I'm on this panel with people I, I, didn't, I didn't belong there. It was uh, 
uh, Rob Clark and DJ Short and Mowgli Holmes and Don Werchafter and Sonny Chiba and me, and total breeders and seeders. And Mowgli showed me on his Mac the early beta of what is now the Phylos Bioscience Galaxy. It's black and white, it's now colored. And I submitted six samples to help them flesh out the cannabis genome. His partner, Nishan, wrote back and said, dude, five of the six we've never seen before, and they helped us define the, what the cannabis genome is. But the weird thing is, all of them match the story you told us. Yo, asshole, of course. And one of the stories was about this Jim, buddy of mine, who I'm still tight with, who had the, it turned out, he said that the film canister came from 1972, the year I got out of high school. I know what I was smoking and distributing back then. When Phylos genetically sequenced it, it was definitely 72, because in 70, 71, what are now the cartels were loosely organized gangs. And they were aggregating stuff grown by families between the corn and the beans. The problem was these were really long, you know, long flower time sativas, and they were different every farm. And so the harvests were staggered. They were trying to export in bulk the Norte Americanos. And so they began to introduce um, Amsterdam genetics to, to rein in those 12, 16, 17 week flower times. But 72 was that transition. So there's land race and also skunk one or whatever. It's, uh, it's listed in the galaxy under LeBlanc C and E. So, and Maui Wowie and a bunch of other old school stuff. So the third chapter is, I go home to Cleveland and I still hang out with my, not just high school, but in many cases, elementary school friends. I took back a big ass bag of Colombian gold 72 Fino, our graduating year. People opened the bag and went, yo! And then they would smoke it. And a couple times I've sent back stuff to my homies and said, do you remember it being like this? One of them, oh, Panama Red is hard to find. And there was some back in the medical days and it, the guy had a bad mother and the clones were weak and it really wasn't a real representation. Panama Black, yes. But um, there are a few, well, a few haven't popped yet. But you know, Oaxacan, Michoacan, and Panama Red are the three go-tos for me. The Colombian stuff and the old Jamaican that had that menthol camphor flavor, what I used to call metallic silver. Um, uh, so some of us old boomers recognize that from a, from a, and the terpenes. So interestingly, they say, well, you know, the pot, tell your kids don't, you know, dare, don't get stoned because it's not, it's, it's way stronger than what you, well, no, actually, Colombian gold came in at 16.7% THC, which is not bad, but the terpenes off the chart. So back to hemp. People think CBD and all this hemp being grown today is like the ditch weed we pulled off the side of the road when we were kids and 16 and 17 years old. No, I'm here to tell you the stuff I grew um, didn't go hot. And we had like one and a half to 2.1% 2, 2 terpenes, not just myrcene beta carotene. I mean, a full spectrum. Smokable, oh my God. Oh. Um, yeah, I want to ask, I want to make sure to talk to you about that because I know you got a lot of interest in smokable flour and a lot of people think hemp is just, like you said, it would just give you a headache, maybe not taste good. Oh, oh no. But you and, I both, you and I both know better. Gary's getting excited. Oh, God. He's going to the treasure chest. All I know, when I was in college, I had friends smoking hemp to quit smoking cigarettes, and it helped them all. And that's, that was my interest. Thank you, Jen, because my husband smokes and often will look for something he can smoke just in, in lieu of or, or to cut back by a portion. And, uh, you know, you don't want to smoke some heavy Afghan, something that'll knock your ass out. Oh! Oh, Jerry, nice. This we call graphite. Um, uh, James Bean, it seeds here now, where all of us should buy our genetics, is a dear, dear friend, used to live here in Seattle. James has been very generous supporting LeBlanc with genetics. This was one that was Patch Adams. It's box times um, cherry wine, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful plant, uh, has anthocyanins, the same chemical that turns you know, flowers different colors, but also maple leaves in the fall, you know? And where we grew in Ellensburg had three nights of frost down to 23 degrees in one case, and it brought out the color. 
So while it's called Patch Adams, and it's from Seeds Here Now, uh, there's others out there like that. But um, we nicknamed it in the market graphite. It, it turned so purple, it made eggplant look pale. Wow. And it tastes just amazing. Now this, Huh. I wish this Zoom session were scratch and sniff. <laughs> so do we, Jerry. <laughs> what is that, Jerry? So this was, um, believe it or not, this, I have a whole bag of this stuff. This was the first plant we cut just to see what it was going to taste like. And they were huge flowers. Um, um, we, so I had two things. To grow hemp, you need a license. And part of the, the rules are in every state, the Department of Agriculture in your state does a pre-harvest inspection 15 to 30 days before your harvest date to make sure that your crop is hemp, not poor ass illegal marijuana. So it can't go hot, meaning it can't exceed that 0.3% THC level. Um, and uh, then you're good to go. This pre-harvest inspection, all it says is, before you harvested, your crop was hemp, not piss poor marijuana. Now, people mistake that um, certificate of analysis, COA. They mistake that lab report and sign off from ag as the final word. No, 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 Because you need to cut it, which is at some point after that, mm -hmm. you need to dry it, trim it, cure it, et cetera, et cetera. The chemistry changes and it might be over 0 0.3 if you wait 14 and a half days. Mm -hmm. So we were testing, again, the nerd in us, we do a lot of R&D, um, with Analytical 360's help, we were testing every four days to track the ratio of THC and CBD through the flowering process. Because mm -hmm. CBD matures before THC, which is good for a hemp farmer, because if you're looking for maximum CBD levels, your THC is probably well below 0 0.3. It'll catch up the longer you wait. So you sacrifice the yield, the weight of the flower, to ensure that it's not THC. Now, I'm of two minds. The entourage effect is the synergetic effect of all the cannabinoids and terpenes working together, not just CBD. Um, my only complaint with 0 0.3 is it's too little THC to evoke a full entourage effect. On the other hand, from a marketing perspective, I make tinctures and topicals. And a lot of mainstream America, especially in what I call unliberated territory, states that don't have legal medical or recreational cannabis, and it's the devil's lettuce and boogeyman to be avoided. That crowd, and especially older people, would rather consume something with 0.0% THC. So because I harvested early, having tracked the the maturation along the way and the tested the products themselves, they really do come in LOQ, limited quanti quantification. The needle didn't move. There is no THC. To me, that's a problem. The medicine still works, but I've thought about making, I had one batch come in at 0 0.296. I could not have been happier because there was enough to make, so the entourage effect was described in a paper by Dr. Ethan Russo in 1971. And so the call out on page two on right hand side says, in the presence of a, a small amount of THC, CBD is two and a half to three times as effective and the same other direction. So people um, um, want 100% pure CBD and using isolate and distillate and that really doesn't make a whole plant full spectrum preparation. And it's not as good as a product with way less CBD, but all this other stuff. When you go to the orchestra, you don't want to hear the piccolo. You want to hear the whole damn band. So um, while everyone needs their endocannabinoid system, their ECS tweaked a little bit and, a, and pure CBD begins the process. It's just the crack in the door. We want to blow the roof off the sucker. So I, um, don't use isolate or distillate. I'm an old hippie. As I said, I used to practice acupuncture. It's not my first or second time at the rodeo. And um, uh, I, for the tincture, it is organic, 
kosher vegetable glycerin, sustainably grown hemp infused from new moon to full moon. Two things. The motto is at Le Blanc CNE, we only use ingredients we'd serve our own mother at the Thanksgiving dinner table. So, you know, you know what I'm saying, you know, shoot, man. And, uh, and, and Jerry, look, this is great, man. Um, I'm learning a lot. I hope that all of you will think about the film canister. Like Chuck said, oh my God, the film canister. Um, please don't discount those conversations. I want to make sure everybody here though, uh, and we won't have time for everybody, but I know we got questions from people who are, who are uh, part of the conversation. Step up folks, who wants, who wants first shot? Oh, Shauna had her hand up. I'm going to give her first shot. Shauna, what, what you got for Jerry? Oh, hold on. You're, I'm going to unmute you. There you go. How do you separate the, the, the hemp plant currently, like for the wood, the core, the, the shell? How, how's that happen? Oh, oh, decorticating. Yes, decorticating. So, um, last year, my <laughs> I used my stems and stems from friends. Um, and in my backyard, uh, I used rainwater. So here's the deal. The first paper maker I work with, works in a tier three and with the owner's wink wink knowledge was taking stems out and he made paper with a number of plants, grasses and flowers and whatnot. And he sent me a video and it included at a certain point, goggles, rubber gloves and boiling and lye. Because I'm a deadhead hippie kind of guy, that was totally not the industry I was trying to grow. With hemp paper and clothing, we're trying to get away from the toxicity involved in the manufacturing process. And so academia.edu, I began to read, it, the process is called retting, R-E-T-T-I-N-G. And so um, literally rainwater in the backyard and me flipping it over. And I actually, again, analytical with their help, um, there are certain bacterias and uh, molds that break apart the pectin. And I tried to uh, isolate those um, by running a microbial test. And if they found my shopping list, they were gonna inoculate Petri dishes. I have discovered another way to do that, to speed the process up. But um, um, it really, I, I'm just now building, uh, and actually this weekend, the first iteration should be built, a solar powered uh, water preparation setup that uh, at a certain temperature, um, pH, um, um, I can hopefully, I've done it in a pot and pan on the stove, I can peel the bast off the herd like peeling a banana in a matter of minutes. My partner, Shane Collins, is fabricating a mechanical decorticator. Um, think of a pasta maker with, or a, a, a laundry machine, just two ringers, you know, but it's more than that. So th there are some, not in the U.S., because there hasn't been a domestic hemp industry for 75 years or whatever. And um, uh, the machinery is either in China or in some cases in Europe. Um, so um, uh, one of the advantages we have is that we're planting a bunch of different cultivars, like at least a dozen, and um, seeing what grows in the Northwest in certain particular areas, da 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 But then also, so we had a friend in uh, the peninsula in Chimicum who grew hemp last year, and the breeder was a friend of mine. It was... Um, Nebraska hemp times Harley Sue, cultivar called Neo. And God bless him. Uh, Kyle was, really, was kind enough to leave 11 rows standing after he harvested the rest. And it read it in the field. And Shane and I were able to go out and bring home just, he has a trailer. We brought home tons of this stuff. He now has material to use to test his the corticator, the mechanical one, but that's the material I use in addition to my own to do this totally non-toxic mm -hmm. workflow. So um, the, the, um, the herd I gave my partner, Rochelle, who wants to do the hemp Crete thing, but the bass I split between New Mexico with Jonas and Morgan Conservatory in Cleveland, and they were kind of like, whoa, yeah, my backyard. Um, you know, I mean, so here's the deal with hemp food, fuel, fiber, medicine, and other. But it's not just replacing soybeans on tractors with Roundup with another plant. It's an opportunity for us to reinvent 
our relationship to the planet. And whether it's substituting hemp as food for feedlots and the cattle industry, not that everyone needs to be vegetarian, but that's a huge dream. And, and, um, and the idea of not that everyone's gonna grow hemp year after year after year, but ideally it's a three year rotation that it's integrated into a farmer's rotation of other crops, be it oats or wheat or green beans or whatever. You can't, you shouldn't do it after uh, brassicas like broccoli and, and the coals and whatnot, but it has a place. Um, and the thing is, because you only make money with fiber at scale, it's gonna be grown in areas that grow soybeans, corn and wheat where you do have large farms, tractors and combines, though there is no John Deere attachment that's specific to hemp. That too will come. As will the 4-H clubs feeding, you know, the, the county extension agents, and it'll take its, it'll slip into its place. But we have a disproportionate op, uh, influence at this early stage to whisper in people's ear. For instance, last year I helped Clemson do a, a, a field trial of some stuff. And this year I provided six cultivars to the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, which is an H, uh, CBU, uh, <clears throat> HBCU. Um, um, because I really do want this to just slide into big ag, but in, in our terms, you know, that it can be grown without toxic chemicals. I grow compost, what pot farmers call probiotic soil. Um, we don't need to deplete the soil, have runoff and fuck everyone else downstream, excuse my French. If we do this sustainably, top to bottom, we have a chance to, to I don't want to say dictate, but to strongly influence what will be a global vertical industry based on our favorite plant, but on our terms. Well, amen. And, and, and I know you brought up, um, among other issues or, or topics, the interest in fungi and things that break down not just bacteria, but fungi that break down the plants. And I know you've been a proponent of helping people understand the idea of living soil and actually yep. uh, making sure that your soil is, quote, teeming with microbes. I know I've been to a couple of different people's houses and they're like, no, don't touch that. That's my jerry bin. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, and we're particularly interested not just in that, but in on down the line as we talk more about fungi, the academy is in the process of developing our first class on entheogens. And that's a whole nother conversation about uh, medical use of fungi. But could you talk to us a little bit about uh, how you get people started about um, thinking about oh. living soil and, and those oh. jerry pens? So, um, so my parents moved into a new house that they built in 1961. And I believe it was 62 that my uncle um, taught my father to grow roses and taught me to garden. And when we dug up the sod, he said, don't throw that away. And we put it in the other side of the yard in a small pile. And I learned to compost in, se in second grade. We fast forward, there are three boys. We are all thumbs in the dirt kind of guys. And <clears throat> when I went home one time, my youngest brother, who's 10 years younger than me, was probably 15, 16. And the compost pile was probably 12 by eight at that point in a mound. He grew sweet corn on. And he went out, had a pot of water on the stove boiling, ran out, picked the corn, dashed back in the kitchen so that none of the sugars turned to starch. It was the bomb. The corn was huge. So we fast forward. I've been gardening, community gardens, my house. I grow all this compost. And there are several people in town, as Trey pointed out. So the city used to give away these a third of a yard green uh, compost bins with black round tops. Now they're on Craigslist for free. And I've collected a whole lot of them. So the deal is, being a socialist, you know, kind of guy, um, I believe in a sharing economy. And so the deal is, I will park a bin in your yard. I will fill it with layers of stuff. I work with a family-owned um, mushroom farm using their spo spent oyster mushroom straw. I raise worms, the red wigglers by the buttload. And, um, and I have an inoculant based on bokashi, the Japanese technique, that I grow on spent coffee grounds. And so I have this thing worked out. And the deal is, you host a bin, I'll fill it. You can have the soil. I want the worms. So I am now uh, selling a kit through Craigslist and next door where you get a 32-ounce takeout container, speaking of the lockdown and takeout, 
full of worms and compost, but also a shopping bag of spent oyster mushroom straw saying, look, you get the worms to break down the kitchen scraps and the yard waste, but the mycelium in this oyster mushroom straw will grow that stuff through. And the worms don't eat your food. They eat what grows on your food. So you want this multi-organism kind of thing going on. And yeah, I, I'm just, if I've used the same, so it's funny. I do Bokashi. My son does Korean natural farming, k and I. We've done a podcast where we joyfully poke each other. Yours is wrong, mine is better. Um, but it's sort of this blend in the middle. He also does biochar. Uh, and uh, so yeah, living soil. I just helped the tier three in Whatcom County. Um, I sold them, you know, you know, maybe a yard and a half worth of this stuff, which they're, re they're jump-starting a farm that was in serious distress. But yeah, it all begins with the soil. And there's a difference between soil and dirt. Dirt's dead, soil's alive. And thank you for that. And that's a great, I'm gonna, we're going to close it there. Um, so, uh, dirt is dead, soil is alive. I love that, Jerry. Thanks. And, um, and thanks for being here today. I knew it was going to be an easy conversation. I always learn something. And, and you're inspiring, man. You just, your love for the plant comes out and, and uh, I, I never forget about the sacred when I talk to you about the plant. And that's easy with some industry professionals, uh, not on this call, but you, you all know how it goes. People who are here uh, to line up at the trough and, and not to learn and teach and share. And uh, Dev, uh, Jerry is definitely a sharer and a teacher and thank you for everything you do. Well, thank you. And then uh, for follow-up, I write a monthly column on hemp for Northwest Leaf. My website is Leblanc C N E L E B L A N C. Leblanc is my last name, Whiting in French. Uh, so Leblanc C N E. Um, I uh, have uh, I think 2021 20, issues uh, uh, online there. I also have a podcast. I'm ready to start up again. But a lot of recordings, a lot of information. And yeah, it's been my distinct pleasure sharing my boundless passion for all things hemp. Thank you, sir, and uh, and thank you for being a friend. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We uh, will ask you to look for these. Oh, look how green screen does that. Uh, these these clever little postcards that are in uh, some cannabis stores around the state. And um, and also, we would love for you to join us the third Saturday in um, in August. We know the third Saturday in August is is a sacred Saturday or a sacred weekend because it's Hemp Fest. And so we're going to ask you to join us. We know there's not a regularly scheduled Hemp Fest in August. There will be an online event in October. We encourage you to please attend. It'll be a Hemp Fest like none other. And it'll be a Hemp Fest that can be attended by people who've never been able to make it here. And so if we think about it like that, please get your friends and family from out of town excited and start to and, and ask them to save it on their schedule. Because it really is. It's an opportunity to learn like none other. And, um, and we know like everybody else is a business and it needs help in these times. Third week, so this third week, uh, two weeks from today, we will have Box Brown. His name is Brian Box Brown on for a conversation about his book, Cannabis, the Illegalization of Weed in America. It's a great story where he talks about Anslinger, the Gorophiles, Nixon and the rest in uh, a graphic novel style that's just really beautiful. So we hope that you will join us. We thank you for joining us today. Please follow us um, on Facebook so that you get all of these um, our, um, information on upcoming Saturday sessions. We have a schedule that's booked out for two months and we're about to put that online. So we hope that you will join us and do look for HempFest, please. After you join us next Saturday, we hope that you'll also go down to where HempFest is usually located with a garbage bag because we are going to have a park cleanup or they are going to host a park cleanup. We encourage you, uh, if you smoke them, bring them for your own personal consumption and uh, we'll smoke one and clean up the park all together and think about the Hemp Fest that comes in October. Nice. Thank you all. Have a great Saturday.